This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Uh, welcome to Unsiloed. I'm Greg LeBlanc and I'm here with uh, Lydia Denworth, who is a uh, contributing editor at Scientific American and also the author most recently of this book, uh, Friendship, uh, The Evolution, Biology and Extraordinary Power of Life's Fundamental Bond. Um, also the author of, of this book, um, I Can Hear You Whisper, um, An Intimate Journey Through the Science and the Sound and Science of Sound and, and Language. Uh, welcome, Lydia. Hi, Greg. It's great to be here. Now, this book, Friendship, uh, I, I found it uh, extraordinarily well researched and, and written, and you cover an enormous amount of territory in terms of you know, brain development, um, in terms of uh, evolutionary biology and psychology, in terms of, of network theory. And, and it's clear that you've straddled a lot of the boundaries that you know, the specialists in, in the academy oftentimes uh, struggle with. And, and you came to it with, with a background primarily uh, in kind of brain science. Um, and you, I mean, it's, it's, but you're, you're ultimately brain science kind of got left in the dust and you wound up talking about so much other stuff. So, so how did you, how did you, how, is this a normal, is this a normal way of, of doing research for you? Do you, do you feel like, um, you know, um, surveying all of these different academic disciplines and then putting together a, a synthesis is, is what makes scientific journalism uh, distinct from kind of academic research? In part, sure. I, I think that I felt in many ways that I had a luxury that a lot of the scientists I was talking to don't feel they have. I, I don't know if, uh, you know, if that's true that they really don't, but um, I was able to just go down any path that was interesting and that seemed uh, relevant. And I, I remember in, in one of my earlier books, um, when I was writing about some epidemiology, you know, people were talking about how you, you need information from as many different disciplines as possible. And when it's all pointing in the same direction, that that really tells you something important. And in epidemiology where that's, it's, it's hard to pin things down, that's especially important. And so I've always used that as a, as a guiding, uh, what's the word, as my, <laughs> as my guide in, in, in thinking about how to approach subjects. I mean, friendship is a huge subject, right? You could talk about, there's so much to do, but I really, I just, I wanted to come at the biology and the evolution. That's the part I think most people don't think about. But there's still a lot, um, a lot to cover. And there's a lot I left out. <laughs> well, I mean, a lot, I've talked to a lot of people on this podcast where we're trying to understand kind of what makes humans different, right? And, you know, what was the moment when humans kind of separated themselves from the rest of the animal kingdom in, in some, to some degree? And, and I think you uh, focus on what we call the, the social brain. And you say that uh, what, what really made humans different was and what the reason why we needed these these big brains was because we needed to navigate this very complex social terrain uh in order to form large communal groups and engage in collective activity um and and i think there's a lot of agreement around this uh but it, it took a while for us to kind of get to that get to that place um and and you mentioned that this is in part because you know, while bones and, and tools and, and that sort of stuff uh, leave some residue behind for the archaeologist to study, you know, we don't really have a, a lot of archaeological evidence to, to, to illustrate how humans have been interacting with, with each other, right? All we have is maybe the biology in the brain uh, and maybe some observations that we have about our, uh, our closest relatives. So, so you know, why did it take so long, do you think, for the, the social brain hypothesis to arise? And that when it did arise, right, it, it seems that, that friendship was, was considered something of a, of a luxury, right? I think you used the quote, um, it, it wasn't really um, something that, that uh, allowed us to survive, but really made survival enjoyable, right? So it was kind of a, you know, uh, an epiphenomenon. It wasn't really the, the, where all the action was more of the action was in conflict and in, in, in battle and, and, and that sort of stuff. Right. Friendship 
well, relationships in general didn't get a lot of attention. The, the ones that got attention were the very obvious biological relations, like a mother and an infant, you know, childbirth and, and nursing is, is clearly there's a bond there and you, and it's not as hard to, to study it. And sexual relationships, of course, we look at, but almost everything else is, um, is a little ephemeral, right? And uh, it exists, we think it exists outside the body. It turns out it doesn't entirely, but uh, it, so scientists, it took them a very long time to get serious about, or to recognize that there was something worth studying there. And um, I give, I mean, and friendship is just a piece of that, but uh, the, the bigger question of, of the complexity of relationships is is part of what, um, we had to appreciate that first. And and it really was like John Bowlby and attachment disorder and the evolutionary, the early um, the early animal scientists um, like Lorenz and Tinbergen in, in Europe who were looking at the evolutionary reasons why animals did the things they did, baby, baby birds imprinting and things like that. That changed our way of thinking about relationships to think about what creatures, individuals got out of it. You know, where where was it getting them? And it was, you know, Bowlby was one of the ones who was the first to apply that evolutionary thinking to human babies and their mothers, and which was just not at all what the rest of the world was thinking. He was kind of persona non grata for a long time because, you know, his ideas really ran counter to what um, to what everyone else was thinking. And, and famously, Harry Harlow in the U.S. was doing the studies with the, the monkeys when he took the little baby rhesus macaques away from their mothers and, you know, gave them wire mothers to choose from. Um, it's a very famous study. And what they were really studying is love, the importance of love, the importance of re relationship and connection. And they were showing that it had some sort of biological basis and that there was and that there was also an evolutionary drive for kind of warmth and connection. I mean, what the and so the, you know, it's just it takes it's like a it's like turning a aircraft carrier or something to to change the way people think about relationships, to change the way they think about um of how we interact and then friendship within all of that is like the last relationship to come under the microscope because it didn't you know it's it, you're not genetically related although it turns out there is a little you're, you're similar genetically similar to your good friends um in ways that are surprising but you know you're not you're not genetically related so you're not advancing your your genetic pool by by having friends you're not uh you're not legally related to your friends the way you are to a spouse. And, um, and so those things always seem to take precedence. And friendship really looked sort of squishy and like the su a subject for, you know, women's magazines or something. But, but it actually turns out to be a matter of life and death. It turns out to be the most important thing for our health and our well-being and and there's there's a pile of evidence we can we can talk about and get into but you know it's it's the this dawning i mean the the story i try to tell in the book is one of the evolution of the knowledge of the way of thinking about this relationship friendship as and and seeing how important it is and understanding it and then you can sort of work that back to see it as a template for all relationships and to understand that that the quality of the bonds that we have with other people is is essential for our health and well-being. Right. So is, is friendship distinct from kind of the family relationships that we have? I mean, biologists have been studying the relationships between parents and children, between, you know, siblings and kin, right, in, in all species for, for, you know, quite a long time and thinking about uh, inclusive fitness, right, and how we want to care for our, our related, you know, folks, we want to care for our, our children, we want to care for our siblings and, and so forth. And we're going to promote their, their genes as you, as you mentioned. Um, and so is friendship when we behave towards others as if they are kin, but, but they're not kin, 
or do these categories blend is, is the family relationship almost a, 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 a subspecies of friendship relationships in, in, in general. And, and you mentioned that in today's world, uh, we no longer make a distinction and we talk about our, you know, spouses as our, as our potential best friends. And sometimes we, we try to be friends with our, our children even, right. Um, it, in the way in which you're approaching friendship, I mean, is it unique to think of them as being indistinguishable from family relationships to some degree? I, I think there are, there's two different paths to go down. So traditionally and technically, our friends are people with whom we do not have sex and that to whom we're not related, you know, biologically related. And that's still true. That's how we think of it. I think that this science of friendship that I explored does two things. It clarifies the definition of what a friend really is, but it also blurs the lines between the categories you're talking about, between family, relatives, and, and romantic partners and friends. And what I mean by that is that, um, you know, beyond the, the distinction I just gave of, the, you know, these, these legal and biological differences with, with friendship, it turns out that the friendship, when we think about friendship as a biological and evolutionary relationship, what it really signifies is a high quality bond between two individuals. Mm -hmm. And it has three requirements, three minimum requirements. And this is sort of across, I mean, you asked me right at the beginning about different fields, child psychology, anthropology, evolutionary biology. They kind of coalesce into this understanding that there are these basic themes that come up or minimum requirements for friendship. It's long lasting and stable. It's positive. So it makes both individuals feel good and it's reciprocal. There's a, there's a back and forth, a, a kind of evenness to it. Um, and everything else that we think of like trust and loyalty and fun and companionship can fit into those buckets. Um, and that quality relationship is the one that gives you the be most bang for your buck in terms of your health and longevity. And I can, I'll, in a little bit, I can give you all my, my, my persuasive list of, of reasons why this is really, really important for your health. But the, it's that quality bond that matters most. And in fact, that quality bond, it can be your best friend or a good friend. It can be with your spouse or your family members, but it isn't, it isn't always that way, right? Unfortunately, not every biological or romantic relationship is so wonderful, right? <laughs> sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. So if we describe our spouse as our best friend or our sibling as a best friend, we're doing it to add something to the description. So it's a category. If I tell you my husband, you know, is, uh, is a friend, you know he's my husband, that means that we got married and we're, bio, you know, we're connected that way. But when I tell you that he's my best friend, I'm telling you something about the quality of our relationship. And the same for, you know, so some people feel that way about their siblings and their relatives and some people don't. My, when I say that I think friendship can be a template for all other relationships, this is what I'm talking about. That what we want to strive to have and what the science tells us is good for us is a really healthy quality bond with, with a, at least a handful of individuals. And they can be family members, or, but they don't have to be. That's kind of the beauty of it is that if you're single and you're, you're an only child, you don't have siblings or you never get married or whatever it is, you can have this bond with friends and it can be just as important for you, for your health and your well-being. Um, and so that's what I mean when I say it blurs the lines. Um, of course, there are distinctions in our genetic, you know, in our kin relationships. Uh, and in our romantic relationships, there are other things going on there that are that are in addition to. But it's this question of the quality that friendship gives us that I think we have overlooked and not given enough attention to. And that's what I there's a lot of talk about loneliness. And of course, in the book, I look a lot at what how bad loneliness is for us. But the flip side is that friendship is really good for us. And that's what I would like people to think about. Well, so. Um, uh you know, with biologists talk about, um, uh, tit for tat, right. And they talk about, um, reciprocal altruism and I, you know, I do something for you and you do something for me. And, 
And the way the biologists talk about it, it seems like there's these, these organisms are, are kind of maintaining a ledger, right? And, and they want to make sure that the ledger is in balance. But you say in the book that, you know, friendship is when you kind of move beyond the, the bean counting, right? And you're, and you're not really too worried about whether the, the ledger is in balance at any particular, particular moment. Um, and so I think that the, when, when you're not concerned about that, that's when you know that you can kind of count on the other person to some degree. Uh, and so you could imagine a marital relationship that was very much a, a, a tit for tat relationship or a marital relationship that's one, you know, that's, that's more like a, a friendship the way you've described it. Is, is that another way to think about it? Yes, absolutely. And, um, and, you know, some, a lot of marriages, I mean, it's one of modern marriage. We aspire to that. That of course, wasn't always true. It wasn't always what marriage was meant to be or, um, or likely to be even, uh, but it, um, but yes, if you can really rely on the other person and, and it's true, we want to move past the, it, it's not an exact tit for tat, tit for tat accounting. Um, but what is true is that over the long haul, there has to be a feeling of, of back and forth of give and take. So it might be that one person in either a marital relationship or a, a good friendship, one person has a lot more going on in their lives. Maybe they just need more help. They need to do more talking um, for a while. Uh, and that's fine. It's the, but over the course of years, there has to be a feeling that there's a, that, that that person will, you know, that there, there'll be an evening out in that. Um, so it's not about, oh, you had me to dinner last week. Now it's my turn to have you to dinner. It is when a deep friendship is exactly when you get past that sort of worrying of, keeping track of whether, you know, you paid for this or I did that or, um, and there's a, there's just a sort of trust and a depth of connection that, that is really lovely that, that, that arises, but it is necessary that there is, I mean, the reason it's reciprocal altruism is because it goes in both ways, right? That, that there's a rest, a reciprocity to it. And, um, so some element of that is important. And yes, in your you know, I hope for most of us that our significant other, romantic other, we have that feeling um, with them, uh, but not everybody does. <laughs> well, before we get, we can come back to the evolutionary biology side of things. And I really want to dig into the health aspects because, um, you know, loneliness has been described as kind of the, the new smoking, right? It's the, the thing which is, I, I think there's some debate about whether it's on the rise or on, on the decline or kind of where it is relative to previous periods. But what one thing that is certain is that there's an increasing recognition that that loneliness or the, the lack of connectedness or the, the lack of belonging is something that can be can be fatal. I mean, I think the evidence is is really kind of overwhelming at, at this point. Um, and and I, I think it's related, of course, to to stress. Right. It's, it's a cause of stress. But but it's it's it's. It's not quite the same in the sense that, um, you know, if I know that I have, have health insurance and I know that I have, you know, all sorts of, uh, social support that's really based on kind of market interactions, it, it really doesn't provide me with the same emotional well being as when that support comes from, from community. I mean, in fact, the, the, the community might actually do, do a worse job of, Right? Of, of supporting me when I encounter poverty and, and, and sickness than maybe an insurance company might. But uh, psychologically, the, the community, the perception of support from the community is going to be much more healthy than the actual right, material and monetary support that I might get from. So, so, so can you talk a bit about kind of what we know right now? What's the current state of thinking about the relationship between connectedness and health? It's really powerful stuff. It's so it's exactly as you said, um, loneliness that I think the most significant thing that we have learned in the last, say, 20 years is just how bad for us loneliness really is. So as biologists say, it gets under the skin. It affects your cardiovascular functioning, your immune system, your cognitive health. So your risk of dementia, your mental health, your risk of depression. It affects your stress responses, your quality of your sleep. It affects your longevity, how long you live. And it, it affects even the rate at which your cells 
age. So lonelier people, um, their the telomeres, little caps on the end of their chromosomes get shorter, faster than than really well connected people. Um, and the and all of those things, loneliness can ha has a negative effect. And being well socially integrated and having good friends right. has a positive effect, right? Um, and so it's, um, it's, and I think it's a little counterintuitive that a relationship that exists entirely outside the body could have that deep of an effect on the way our neurons work and our trans, you know, our neurotransmitters and our, our cells and our stress responses and our, our heart, you know, it affects your heart rate and things like that. Um, and when you eat food, you know, we think about diet and exercise all the time, right? And right. diet, of course, what you eat, you can imagine, you can understand why what you put in your body then has an effect on your overall health. And when you're going for a run and you feel your heart pounding and your muscles working, you can imagine why that's connected to your overall health. But how is it that sitting and talking to a friend who's, you know, exists outside your body uh, can have an equally powerful effect. And it's, that's, that's the leap that scientists had to make. And they, and they did, it, it's taken a while. And I'm not saying, of course, if you stop eating, you will die relatively quickly. So it's over the long haul that friendship and the quality of our relationships has this effect. Um, but, but in the end, over the long haul, it says is important for your health as diet and exercise. And, and yet we don't, I mean, if I can do my little soapbox, we don't deal with it that way or we don't treat it that way in our in our lives. It tends to be a, a thing that 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 we don't prioritize. You know, we'll schedule our workouts and our and we'll worry about how much what we eat. Most of us will think about how we eat, what we eat. We don't think about our time with friends in this way. And the lovely part of this science is it's not that it's adding to our to-do list, but it's more that, hey, you get to hang out with your friends and, and call it a jog. <laughs> it's like, you've, yes. you know, you've done something good for yourself. And so, um, so that's the story on the, on the health front. And um, the, the, arg you know, the, the, and it was looking at loneliness that, that helped us to, um, it's easier, I guess, to focus on a negative because you can see the effects um, you can sort of tie the effects to to something, and then that the then it it. But then the flip side is to recognize that the positive is is good for us. And you know when when those first studies came out, there were studies about lonely the effect of loneliness on the immune system and the way that it um, changed which genes are expressed in the white blood cells. Um, you know, I mean, it's right down to these very very specific things that make you susceptible to. Uh, inflammation and viruses and, um, you know, it's like, why would your leukocytes care about whether you're lonely or not, right? I mean, that doesn't seem, you know, people said, what? That, you know, and that what we've now found is that that same response in the body that we get from loneliness is a response in the face of all, different kinds of adversity. So it's not unique to loneliness. What it's telling us is loneliness is right up there with huge trauma and poverty and other things. Um, and that is the thing that nobody really appreciated until recently. You know, it was sort of thought like you just have to get on with it. You have to, um, you know, it's uh, it's something that we're coping with. It's just an emotion, but it's not, you know, it's not, uh, it's not critically important for your health. Um, and it is. Well, it seems like the physiological response to uh, loneliness is, very similar to the physiological response that you get from low status, right? So there's a lot of research also on, on status and the kind of infl inflammation and the kind of deferral of things like, you know, maintenance and, and, you know, viral protection and so forth. Th this kind of makes sense if the low status or loneliness is a, a, um, essentially a signal that you're about to get attacked, right? You know, you're about to be, uh, you know, beaten up or, um, assaulted in some way in, in a violent fashion. Right. And so is that, is that really kind of the origins of it? And I know you've, you've mentioned a lot of different animal studies, right? We can look at baboons and we can look at other primates and we can, we can measure their, their status. We can also kind of measure their, their, their loneliness. I mean, we can't interview them and give them the, the loneliness scale, but we can kind of measure how much kind of 
connectivity they have with other members of their community, right? Yes. And that's been really important work in helping us to understand and to see how we, to, to, to see how these kinds of relationships might um, go beyond or that there's a deeper story here than what we ever imagined. You know, we, we thought of friendship as cultural for a long time. We thought of it as a byproduct, a nice, lovely byproduct of human language and civilization. Um, and of course, there are many cultural aspects to friendship that are important. But it's in looking at baboons and macaques and, and all kinds of species, but especially the non-human primates, um, because their social interactions are more similar than uh, to ours and their brains are more similar to ours. Their, their biology is relatively similar. Um, and you can, and also so computers helped <laughs> because now what scientists can do is literally track the the interactions of whole troops of animals uh, and they tried to do this by hand before the computer processing got um, you know and it was it was just very very hard to do you, you pretty quickly you you know the the complexity of the relationships um, is is just hard to capture but now they you know so these scientists are out there I I, I liken them to sort of very exacting gossip columnists and they watch these these animals with this um, very sort of specific routine of observation called focal sampling, where you watch every animal just for sort of 10 minutes at a time, but you record who does what to whom, who's nearby, what they're, you know, how they're spending their time. And you run all that data into the computer and it out pop these amazing graphs that, that just show you exactly how connected everybody is. And um, and then you follow those same animals over the course of um, their lives and you get a sense for their health, their longevity, you know, how long they live, whether they have babies, how healthy their babies are. Uh, and of course, in evolutionary terms, those things like longevity and reproductive success, that's that's what we're all after. That's that's the, <laughs> that's basically the, the, the big kahuna of evolutionary um, efforts, right, is to is to have healthy babies, to live yourself. And um, and it's in those other animals that we saw this for the first time that the ones, so it was the first in the baboons in Africa, but that the baboons with the strongest quality social bonds lived longest and had more and healthier babies. And it was like a eureka moment for these scientists because they said, wait a minute, <laughs> this is... Uh, there's something really important here going on, and it's not what they expected. They, you know, these all these uh, non-human primate societies are hierarchical, so they very usually very hierarchical. Everybody has an exact status, you know, um, and they this the primatologists who spend their time watching these animals assumed that that dominance was probably the most important factor in terms of health and longevity and reproductive success. And when they started thinking about friendship or something like it in these animals and, and measuring, you know, how nice they were to each other and then looking at what that got them, they were surprised to discover that the, that the friendship abilities, the, the ones who had the best friends, <laughs> did the best. And that that turned out to be even more important than the dominant stuff. And, and that's when it, it suddenly said, wait a minute, this actually has bearing on human beings too. Um, because in, in monkeys, you can strip away a lot of the complexity of human life and you can get down to the core of what, you know, what you're really trying to study and measure. And, uh, and, but then in humans, we have found um, similar things when we, there's, there's far fewer studies than where we track human beings their whole lives, but there are some. And the ones that there's a really important one from Harvard that I mentioned at the end of the book and where they followed a group of men from their late teens and 20s all the way through into their 80s if they live that long. And and what they found, I think it's one of the most striking statistics in my whole book, is that uh, is that. Was this the farm? Was this the Farmingham study or the? Or the no, study? this is the uh, Harvard Adult Development Study. The, so all the men from the uh, it started in the twenties and thirties, uh, and um, they followed them their whole lives, keeping you know track of various you know what they did, their health over the years, and uh, and it was only about seven hundred, a little more than seven hundred people, but the best predictor of who was going to live to be healthy 
and happy in their 80s was not their cholesterol level or their wealth or their professional success, but it was how satisfied they were with their relationships at 50. That was what told you what was going to happen at 80. And um, and that was such a surprise to these researchers, too. And they, you know, it's it took us 60 years to get that result. Right. Because we had to follow these people in in the monkeys. We can do it faster. Um, But it's the same. It's the same basic result. It's telling us that the the quality of our connections with other people really, really matter. And I think the message in that Harvard study, too, is that friendship and now here i'm talking in the biggest sense of quality bonds like we, where we talked earlier right and um, having those quality relationships in your life it's a lifelong endeavor and it's something that you don't want to wait until say you're retired and now i have time now <laughs> to spend with my friends right i you you know where you are at 50 is going to have an effect on 80 which means that where you are at 20 is going to have an effect on 50 and where you know it's it's a um it's it's a set of of skills and situations you need to put yourself, you need to make yourself available for friendship. Um, and there are real costs if you don't. Right. And I think you, you draw parallels between this research into friendship and, and the research that's, that's done on kind of, you know, infant and, and child development, right? So we, we know about the horrible outcomes uh, from the orphanages, right, in the 19th century and even in, you know, more contemporary times, right, the famous Romanian orphanage studies and the lack of quality, right, um, support and interaction that these uh, young people had with uh, a parent or a parent-like figure, I mean, it was essentially fatal. I mean, they had access to all of the the, the nutrition that, that they could, you know, possibly need. They had attract, they had, you know, they had warmth and temperature regulation and, you know, bedding and, you know, all the material needs that they could possibly require were were, were there, um, and, and yet their, uh, lack of social support, it, it led to extremely high mortality rates. And, and so I think, I guess a lot of people thought that, oh, well, once you get through that hump, right, once you're past a certain age, uh, these, these bonds kind of don't matter anymore. And you're just kind of sent off to do your thing. And, and, uh, and I think what you highlight is that, um, it really is kind of like, like smoking, right? I mean, it, it's, it's something that if you do it in your childhood, it's going to, it's going to hurt you. If you, if you do it in your adulthood, it's going to hurt you. And, and, you know, it's always good to quit, but, um, you know, you'll never be able to completely recover from, from all the smoking that you did, uh, you know, earlier in life. Right. Damage will be done is, is the way that one of the epidemiologists put it to me. If you, if you quit smoking in, in your sixties, that's still good. It's better to quit. Just like, the reverse is true. It's if you haven't been focused on friendship, it's better to focus on it than not at that point. But how much better is it? Damage will have been done by not spending time with friends in the interim. And it's so much better to sort of work to maintain those relationships all through your life. And I'm totally realistic here. I I know that there are different times of life where we have a lot of different demands on us. And in your um adult, you know, 30s, 40s, into your 50s, where you're raising a family and maybe have a career. And, you know, if you have all of that going on together, that can feel really overwhelming. And people say they have a very hard time um, focusing on friends. My message is to say, like, you know, it, it may not be the same as when you're younger or older, but you shouldn't abandon it altogether. Because, yes, we really need to understand that this is a lifelong endeavor. And, and for the, the, children, the part that I think is interesting there is that we don't, we don't talk to children very much when they're young about how important it is to be a good friend and what it will mean for their lives. You know, we spend a lot of time talking to our kids about achievement and, you know, what they're, you know, how to organize their time and things like that. Um, And it's not that we don't care about their friendships. I mean, obviously, especially if you have a child who is lonely or or seems to have social uh, some social issues um those parents are worried but uh and but i and they should be i mean that's that can be it can be a serious problem but but what i want to sort of focus on here is just saying that in general i think adults should be thinking about the fact that when kids learn how to be a good friend is when they're young 
right? They're, that, that these are skills that they're developing and we can help them. We can help put them in the right situations. We can talk about what it means to be a good friend. We can model the importance of friendship in our own lives um, and, and articulate it a bit. You know, you can say, oh, I love it when my friend Moira sends me a funny text, you know, it really makes me laugh. Or, you know, I, I used to say when my kids were young, you know, that I was having a mommy play date. You know, it was my turn to have a play date. I was going to go out with my friends and put it in a, in a context that they could understand. But that, you know, to say this is something that matters for me, too. And of course, I'm not saying you should abandon your, your children or in favor of your friends, but you should not. Neither should you subsume yourself so much in your family that you don't um, that you don't spend any time with your friends. And then you're sending the wrong message to your kids about what what yeah. that looks like. So the way we talk about it. The way we think about it, we need to understand that kids don't come into the world. They come, well, they come into the world with a kind of propensity to be social, right? And a desire to be social usually. But there are skills that they have to learn. And, and they don't, you know, they need to practice. And we need to help encourage that and, and see it um, as this, this setting themselves up for a good future, you know, by, by getting good at those, at those skills. And I actually think I'll just, um, Say I, I gave you earlier my definition of a quality friendship is a lifelong is a you know lasting positive reciprocal relationship. I think that gives us some clues as to what it means to be a good friend. It means to be a steady, reliable presence in somebody's life. It means to f- make them feel good. You know, when was the last time you said to a friend, I, "You know, here's what I really like about you," <laughs> right? Or I just I so appreciate that you did that for me. Um, and, and it means to show up and to, and to give back. That's what the reciprocal part to be, to be helpful, basically. Um, and to be noticing, you know, what's going on in your friend's life. And so we can talk to kids about that, like talk about what a good friend actually is. I think we're, we'd be doing them a really, really good favor if we did that early uh, and in a way that they could osmose as they grew up. And so friendship is, a, it's a skill, right? It's, it's not something that, that, you know, it just, you can expect to organically develop necessarily, right? It needs some, some guidance. I mean, same thing with, you know, eating well and, and, and exercising, right? These are things that you kind of have to kind of learn how to do potentially, and, and maybe, you know, it requires a little bit of, of discipline under certain circumstances. I always wonder that, you know, public health, we, we emphasize the, the quick fixes, right? And anything that we can give somebody a pill or, or whatever, you know, you can write a prescription for it. Um, writing a prescription to exercise is, is a tough thing and writing a prescription to, you know, eat well is, is another tough thing. And, and writing a prescription to go get, go get some friends is, is also a, a, a pretty, pretty tough thing. Um, and, and I guess, you know, people would want some guidance and they'd want some classes if they don't know how to do it. Like how, how, how do you go about doing it if you don't know how to do it? Right. If you weren't taught at a young age to, to do this, how would you figure it out? Well, it's, um, so it's not just one skill, it's a series of skills. Uh, and you know, I'm, um, yeah, I find people, they do, they want, they want, I get asked a lot, you know, how to fix this for people. And it's, of course, <laughs> it's not, it's not so simple. Um, we should have a big, we should have a big, uh, you know, social infrastructure project. Anyway, we need a trillion dollar, you know, bill for, to boost friendships in America. But, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll stick to my knitting here, my, my, um, my theme and say, you know, the things I just said, like how, um, Thinking about being reliable, being a steady presence for people, showing up, being um, listening. So a lot of relationships that are problematic are lopsided. And one person does all the talking and the other one does all the listening or one does sort of does all the efforts. That's where we were talking earlier about reciprocity and the tit for tat and moving yeah. beyond that. And it is important to move beyond that, but it's also important to recognize that it can't be all one sided. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, and the positive part of relationships. So I, I hear from a lot of people who talk about, um, fr- friends they've had for a very long time, like w- with whom they have a lot of shared history, but who they find draining, that word comes up a lot, right? Well, draining is not good. <laughs> it's not that relationship. It may serve a certain purpose. I'm not saying that you have to get rid of that relationship entirely, but I do think we we could do a better job of of being a little more clear-eyed about 
which relationships serve us the best and sustain us. And they are going to be the ones where we get something positive out of it. It leaves us usually feeling better, you know, for having done it. I mean, you know, right at the beginning of our conversation, we were talking about um, John Bowlby and the other scientists who first started thinking about relationships in this different way. And, um, and one of those early scientists described a relationship as a series of accumulated interactions that build on each other, right, over time. So your friendship is the content of all the times you've been together in the past. Uh, and I thought that was really an interesting way to think about it because it, it is true that, you know, and when you, I mean, if you've known somebody a long time, you don't, you don't think about that. Um, but when you're first getting to know someone, you do, you sort of, you know, you have deeper conversations as you go along and that, that feels more, it starts to feel more natural. Maybe there's a moment where you open up to each other or there's a moment where somebody, you really like their sense of humor and realize that it, it jives with yours or, um, you know, it, it does build on itself. And, um, and so a relationship is about your accumulated history, but it is also about how it makes you feel today. And so that's important too. And, uh, and so we need, let's see, for people who struggle with friendship, I, there's two things that I like to point out that I think, especially as adults, we forget or we're less, we don't think about that making and maintaining friends requires to, in addition to these sort of traits of friendship, it requires time and vulnerability. You have to put in the time. Um, and so there's an interesting study out of the University of Kansas where they actually counted up the amount of time that it takes people. You probably saw this in the book. It, it takes about 50 hours with someone of you know, time together to go from thinking of them as an acquaintance to a friend. And maybe 80 or 90 hours to be a good friend and a full 200 hours to consider someone your best friend. Um, and 200 hours is easy to come by if you're a college student living with people, mm -hmm. in, yeah. you know, eating with them, partying with them, in class with them. Um, it's really hard for you and me in our life right now, right? When you're, when you're an adult and you, you live with your family or by yourself or you, and you're working. Um, and so you've got to put in that time. and now, but time alone is not enough. I mean, there's people that we work with who are colleagues who we might like perfectly well. We might spend 400 hours with, but we know we don't become friends, right? And so that the time and proximity is only a piece of it. Um, but I think people forget. So if you're an adult and you move to a new city and you're trying to make some new friends, you know, you can get frustrated quickly. Uh, but you have to recognize that like, you know, if you count up, say, f I need 50 hours before this person is going to feel like a friend, um, then I think you might look at it differently. You might realize you have to just keep going back um, a bit more. And when I said about being vulnerable, that's the part that's so hard. But you, especially in that kind of situation, you have to be willing to get out there and introduce yourself to people, try to meet people. And that can feel scary and people don't want to feel rejected. They worry, you know, um, that they'll feel uncomfortable or that people won't like them. And, um, and, but there's no, you know, you certainly won't make friends sitting on your couch by yourself. <laughs> so the only way to do it is to get out there. Well, do you think, uh, modernity kind of puts a lot of roadblocks in our way and, you know, particularly American culture puts a lot of roadblocks in our way when it comes to development of friendship. I mean, I think we, we, it certainly makes acquaintances, acquiring acquaintances fairly easy. And a lot of people describe American friendships as, as acquaintances, right? When you compare them to the kind of friendships that you see in other cultures. Um, but you know, whether it's our mobility, right? I mean, you moved to Hong Kong and, and, and back and, um, you know, we all run off to college and then we disperse. I, I mean, I would say that 90% of the people that I consider, um, friends don't live within, you know, a hundred miles of me. Um, and even though a lot of them I acquired here in, in Berkeley, you know, they, came through as students and left, they came through as professors and left, they came through. And so, you know, American culture in particular is, is highly, highly mobile. Whereas in say France, you can born, be born and live and die in Paris your entire life. Right. Um, and, and then, you know, there's the, the constant, uh, workload, there's this kind of nuclear family isolation. And then, you know, especially with kids, with so many single kids and, and all, all the homework and nobody lets their kids 
leave the house unsupervised, right? It's, it's very difficult for them to forge relationships except, uh, maybe on, on, you know, Roblox or, or something like that. Is it, are we, are we kind of inadvertently making it extremely difficult for people to, uh, acquire this extremely important nutrient for, for their lives? And, and are there ways that we potentially could kind of push back against some of the some of these obstacles or does it just require like more willpower than it may have acquired in a world? You mentioned these folks in Sardinia and, you know, and, and the Greek islands, they, they all live to be a hundred, but you know, they don't really have to do anything. I mean, they just sit in their, sit in their living room and all these people kind of wander in and wander out. And then, you know, they, they, can't, they don't even have locks on their doors and, 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 uh, and, and it's really kind of, it, they don't really have a lot to resist in order to keep that Friendship they have, development. right. They have this very strong built-in community uh, that it's true that we don't have that in the same way. And the mobility stuff I find fascinating. And it's, it really is one of the enormous changes in the way, certainly Americans, but, but to some extent, everybody around the world has, has, you know, our culture has changed and but here in the U.S., yes, we we often pick up and move from where we're born. We go to school, maybe we get we move for jobs. And but at the same time, technology has changed and that has made that mobility. It has dampened some of the effects of that mobility. It's why you are still Facebook friends with people you went to high school with and college with who you maybe haven't seen in decades. Right uh, now. There's a difference, of course, between that kind of Facebook friend and, and real friends. Um, and actually technology, well, what's interesting is that we often, we decry social media and, and digital technology. Um, and we think of the word friend as kind of devalued currency because of the way it's been, you know, thrown around um, by the likes of Facebook. But, but. People turn are smarter than that. They know the difference between a real good friend and a Facebook friend. And in, when they are studied, they say that only maybe 30% of their Facebook friends are real friends, you know. Um, so mm -hmm. it's not, it's actually, you know, there is a, there is a difference there. Um, so I think what is, what you're getting at is, yes, that, that the, our modern way of living um it throws up some some sort of new challenges on that front. But on the other hand, you know, it's important to point out that it wasn't all wine and roses for all the people who were stuck in one place, <laughs> right? I uh, mean, maybe you didn't get along. You didn't see eye to eye with any of the people in your small town and um, and you were desperate to leave. And that's why, you know, so many people strike out mm. for the big city here in New York where I am or, Bur you know, they come to California or something, you know, um, it's because then you find more people who are like-minded, uh, you know, who, um, or who you're drawn to people who are interested in the things you're interested in. And so that mobility can, is a double-edged sword. It can work really, it can work wonders to, to give you the ability to go out and live in a place where you're like more likely to be surrounded who are with people who, you know, you're drawn to, or it can take you away from, from friends and family and, um, and so, yeah, the, you know, the thing that I'm getting at is, is recognizing that if you do that, if you are moving around and you're feeling that it's hard to make friends in new places and find that community, that you do have to make some effort. It won't just come to you. Um, that's, that's the, sort of the trade-off, I guess, of, of this modern life that we live, um, is that we need to, you know, it was one of the nice things, actually, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a, um, a, a nice kind of silver lining was that there people described a real sense of community in their blocks and in their in their community you know in their neighborhoods and and where they were looking out for each other right if somebody was elderly and was couldn't go to shopping to get food like younger people we had our first we had our first actual halloween um trick or treat in my neighborhood i think before they 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 didn't do it out of fear that I don't know, there were predators or something. And, and so that now they, they seem to, but then they did. Yeah. Then you, then it, then it became, then it became a way for the, you know, and yeah, people sat out on their, you know, lawns, like on this one street. Right. And, um, and, uh, and connected in that way. And so, you know, it's, 
which also, by the way, I think it's important to point out because we were talking about loneliness, um, is that it's important to understand the difference between loneliness and social isolation, which was the thing that we pretty much all experienced during the pandemic. One is subjective. So loneliness is the mismatch between the amount of social connection you want and the amount that you have. Uh, and isolation, social isolation is more objective. It's an actual count of your social interactions and the number of people in your social circle. Um, and it can be unhealthy for you too, uh, to have a very limited, you know, um, amount of connection. But that fe the way you feel about it, that subjective feeling is where the real harm seems to come in with your, with your health and well-being. Um, and so that was during the pandemic, you know, people were in different, like if, if you were able to sort of create small pods or you had other people in your household that, that you could stand to be in such close quarters with for all that time, you know, um, and that, that you could draw strength from, then you were less lonely, obviously, than the people who were alone and socially isolated, you know, who needed to get out in the world more. So um, I just want to make that point because I think it's important mm. for people to understand that. And you mentioned before that loneliness is like the signal that you're in danger. I mean, it's why, you, you know, generally humans don't live alone. They very rare, right? You know, for um, for them to be alone. And it's why baboons don't live alone, right? I mean, there are some species of other animals that that are more solitary, but a lot of... of um, of creatures, you know, come together in groups and or or at least in small groups. And and we benefit from that. We we keep each other safe. We give each other. But, you know, we we help each other find food. We I mean, they, you know, in a really evolutionary point of view. But like you what I sometimes say is that back in the day, it was to literally save us from the lions. You know, you would rally. Each other. And now that's the figurative lions, but we still need each other and we, we rely on each other in, in, in hard times. That's what friends are truly for. But I'm, I'm getting off your question here. I'm rambling oh. a little bit. <laughs> well, we were saving us from the lions, but also kind of saving us from other people, probably. That, that was the, the bigger threat in most of But, but uh, you're mentioning kind of the social buffer hypothesis, right? Which is sort of that you know, it's the, the loneliness is not going to show up on, on the, uh, on the death certificate, right? It's, it's but rather, it, it makes you more vulnerable to other things, um, you know, like viruses, but it also makes you more vulnerable to other stressors. So if you experience stress at, at work, or if you experience financial stress or whatever, those stressors will be kind of mitigated if, if you if you feel like you have uh, belonging community and, and social support, right? Yes, that's that's absolutely right. We need that. Um, you need that those people to talk to, to feel, you know, supported by and and you get some protection from that. I mean, the the social buffering is really interesting because when kids are young, it's really their parents that that provide that um, that that buffering. And you see it physiologically, the cortisol levels come down. And so the, the tests they do are. Um, they make kids do, you know, public speaking and things like that, that public speaking sort of makes us universally stressed, it turns out. And uh, and so it's enough so that it works for, you know, scientists to use it as a uh, as a yeah, way. When you get that through IRB, you right. can't have like a, you know, a, <laughs> it's a, a, a way of vicious using, barking right. dog, right. you know, attacking the child. Right. That would no, probably wouldn't yeah. get through IRB. Well, that's also true. Right. But it's it's a, it's a universe. It's a consistent enough way of inducing stress that, that we use it all the time to study that. And, and so in young children, the presence of their mothers especially can, can calm down those, those stress responses in their body. Um, and then around puberty, your parents don't have that ability anymore to get into your hypothalamus and, and calm you down. They, then your friends start to have more ability to affect, to buffer the stress responses in your body. And, um, which is super interesting. I mean, it makes sense that that's, but then that's what happens in adolescence, right? You get, you start to get really fixated on friends and people outside of your family. And, uh, and it turns out that your, your, even your biology is, is reflecting that. Um, well, you mentioned these different styles of kind of friendship behavior. Um, is, is there, so you can talk a bit about those, but is there sort of a, a trade-off between quantity and, and, and quality, right? Um, kind of loose ties and, and, 
and strong ties. I know there's a ton of work in kind of network theory about which of those will benefit you materially, right? In terms of getting access to jobs and so forth. But is there, is there a trade-off when it comes to the kind of health benefits and the, and the psychological benefits? Well, I, I usually say that um, quality matters most um, and that, but quantity is not unimportant, but quality matters most because if, if you don't have those strong, I mean, to really feel that there's someone out there that you can count on in a crisis, you need some depth of that relationship usually, right? Uh, and, and the step change in terms of your health, the biggest step change is from zero to one friend. So mm -hmm. one friend will make an, a world of difference in somebody's life. Uh, having a variety of friends gives you other things. It gives you diversity of experience. It gives you diversity of, of, uh, of exposure to everything from, you know, um, viruses to ideas. Uh, and as you said, like the, the weak ties are often where we get new information or like job tips and things like that from people we don't know all that well, but that, you know, if you only ever were, you know, talking to the same four people all the time, you're, there's a whole lot of the world that you're not going to know about. Right. Um, and so, but if, but from a real health perspective, I think that the most critical thing is that, is that core of a handful of people that you really feel, um, connected to and that you can trust and that you have that high quality bond with. So if I have to pick, I'm going to, I'm going to say that <laughs> I'm going to say quality trumps mm -hmm. quantity. Um, it's good to have a bench though. It's good to have a variety of friends that, you know, often people have different friends that serve different kinds of need, fill different needs in their lives or that they, w with whom they connect about different kinds of things. I mean, you might, when you're a parent of young children, you know, you tend to spend a lot of your time with other parents of young children and that's what you talk about, right? You know, cause you're, you're just, you're figuring all that out. And then that's not nearly so interesting to you when you're, when you're older or younger, when you don't have kids of your own, you don't really want to hear about it. Um, so you spend your time with other people, right? It's, uh, and so it's, there's, so the styles, um, there's no one way to do friendship. That's important to understand. There are some bounds of normal, um, but you know, and evolution does dictate that, like, there's different strategies that get you to the same place. You know, what I would say is that being a friendly, sociable person seems to be your best bet for, you know, evolutionary success. But, but there are different ways of doing it. And what psychologists discovered is that there are these styles. They originally had three. So, um, now you're going to have to help me. I'm, <laughs> I haven't talked about this in a while. So Independent, I'm discerning, and acquisitive. There we go. Okay. Discerning. You're, you're, acquisitive. you're apparently acquisitive. I'm acquisitive. I'm acquisitive. Yes, I am. But, um, so, but discerning is where you really sort of have like just one or two very good friends and that's, and you prefer that, right? And you're not looking to, to have a lot of friends. Independent is the, um, is the, op is where you're really not that connected to people, you sort of meet people circumstantially in life, but you don't tend to work hard on keeping any of those relationships going. And acquisitive people are acquiring relationships all through their lives and, you know, are looking to make friends. And yes, that's, <laughs> that's me. I have, I do feel like that is me. But what is interesting is that a sort of second set of psychologists took this idea and then they studied it a little further and they broke the acquisitive people into two categories. Um, selective, selectively acquisitive and unconditionally acquisitive. And I, so I do think I'm selectively acquisitive, which means that I have like the core group of good friends that I spend more time with and I talk to more, but I have, mm -hmm. but I stay friends with people over the years. And I, um, and I've enjoyed that. In fact, one of the things that was really lovely about the friendship book was that when I, I got to do about six weeks of touring before the pandemic shut the world down, and it was a bit of a rolling reunion because it was a book about friendship. It inspired, you know, my high school friends and my college friends and my former work colleagues. You know, people would come out um, en masse to come to the events and then we'd all go out to dinner. And uh, and it was great. <laughs> it was like not a lot of books will get, you know, I mean, people show up, which is lovely, but not quite at this level. And I, I, I think gave it them was, an excuse. I gave them an excuse and it gave them an excuse to see each other. Turn them away, right? It wasn't just about me. I knew that, but, um, but I didn't care because, you know, they came out and that was great. Uh, but, um, but so 
and I wouldn't have, you know, um, a lot of those kinds of people, uh, honestly, if social media didn't exist, some of that stuff wouldn't have happened because yeah. that was an easy way for people to sort of talk about it and get together. And, and, um, and so anyway, there's, uh, so yes, I still have friends from high school, friends from elementary school, friends from college that I see. Um, but, um, but, there is, like I'm saying, there's no one way to do it. You don't have to have that sort of bigger social network. Um, what you need critically is that core of some people that you can really count on, even if it's only one. Well, if we go back to where you started on the brain science, I found one of the more interesting uh, findings in the book was this idea that, um, you know, people start to think and think, right? It's almost like, you know, what wires together, fires together, but it happens across kind of organisms when uh, people become friends. So not only can you predict who's going to become a friend based on their responses to various stimuli, but you can also kind of predict that once they become friends, the, their, their thinking is going to become more, more, uh, more, more similar in terms of their response to, to, parent, to, to stimuli. Right. I thought that was fascinating. I mean, that is the very newest neuroscience of friendship is looking at the patterns of resp of brain processing. And, you know, the the study that you're talking about was was looking at videos. Uh, so it was like literally friends see and hear the world more similarly than people who are not friends. And and that and that effect goes out to three degrees of separation and then sort of phase. But so, you know, you can you can see. So, right. What they they were able to look at a whole group of people uh, and then predict who was friends with who based on how they processed the videos that they watched, what they found funny, where their attention, their, especially, it's especially attentional, but what was striking was how much of the brain uh, this was true of. And then, yes, when you are, you know, when you're in conversation with someone, your brain waves align more and um, you look more similar, you know, after you've talked than, than before. Uh, Maybe not during this more polarized political time we have. <laughs> if mm -hmm. only we could all, you know, align our brainwaves a little bit more. But, um, but so what it means, it's to me, it is fascinating and profound, but also it's actually something in many ways we've known all along. Like Aristotle knew that we were drawn to people who were more similar to us than not. He just didn't know that it goes right down to the level of your neurons, like the way that you're, you know, certain parts right. of your brain are processing the world. And, and that's, that does seem to be what it, what it does. What we don't know is the extent to which you seek out people who already see the world like you or, yeah. or how much your, it is that your brain, your, is changing in a friendship. And it's probably like a lot of things, some of both. Um, but that's the work that's ongoing right now. Well, it's like an internal mass manifestation of, of mirroring, right? So we, we know that, you know, when people are, are talking and, and they're kind of getting along, they, they start to mimic each other's external expressions and, and body movements. And, and so this is just sort of a, a you know, following the, the, the insight towards the interior of the body, right? Right. I suppose so. Yeah. I hadn't thought about it exactly that way, but yes, it is. There's a, there's a, there's just this, yes. Um, I, a coming together and aligning. And now they're studying, you know, two brains at the same time and looking at how that friendship dance, what does that look like, you know, in, in real time, in two, you know, corresponding brains. And I'm so fascinated to see what they find. Well, I think you're a bit like me in that, um, you know, you can't think of any better way to spend an evening than to throw a dinner party and, and have a whole bunch of people over, maybe some close friends with a couple of you know, not so close friends in the mix just to make, make it interesting. Um, this book is, is really a, a fascinating, uh, subject for a discussion of at a dinner party. If you want to throw one and, and, you know, make everybody go read it first, because it does cover so much ground. Uh, Lydia, I really appreciate you joining me today. It's been a lot of fun. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 